Happy Mother's Day, moms. Hopefully you were able to get a picture out front, breakfast in the back. Make sure they take you to lunch today somewhere. Enjoy that. Will you turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter one? 1 Samuel chapter one. And just so, uh, for those of you who are dedicating children this morning, I did not forget. Uh, we're gonna do that at the end. So just wanted to let you know, in case you were worried. But um, today we are celebrating moms and I wanna give a little context to where we're headed here in 1 Samuel to kind of help you understand what we're about to read. Uh, we have this man with a very strange name. His name is Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, and uh, he must be somewhat affluent because we're gonna find that every year they had the ability to travel to Shiloh where they would worship God and uh, to be able to travel like they did and to have two wives because one wife is expensive enough, amen to that, <laughs> right? So Hannah, I love you moms. Hannah is uh, the one we're gonna focus on today. There's Penina and Hannah, and we wanna focus on Hannah. She had a pretty big problem in that Hannah was barren. She could not have kids. So this is an affliction that's causing both, both internal and external shame. This is not a time where you wanted to be barren, not that you ever want to be, but the law said if a wife was not able to have a child in the first 10 years, that was grounds for divorce. Or you could marry a second wife. And that's what we find here. Elkanah was with Hannah. He loved her very much. He didn't want to throw her away, but he was wanting to have children. So he had married another woman by the name of Penina. So I want you to know that as we begin reading in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 4. Here we go. It says, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. So notice... She's got lots of children that she's had for Elkanah. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. So this is why you don't want two wives because they start picking on each other and before long you got trouble, right? Verse seven, this went on year after year. Penina is provoking Hannah. And whenever, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she, kept, till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Do I not mean more to you than 10 sons? Now, isn't that spoken like a true male right there? <laughs> Hannah, is my love not enough for 10 sons? And she's like, shut up, dude. I just want children, right? So it didn't really matter how much Elkanah loved her without children. She felt she had no value. Without children, she was a target. And there's this new word you hear a lot today called church hurt of people who go to church and there's mean church people and they get hurt by someone in the church. Can you imagine that every year when they traveled to worship God, the very place where they worshiped, imagine having someone there who would remind you of what you don't have, who reminded you of where you fell short, of what God didn't give you. Tell me that wouldn't be enough to wanna leave the church, right? To, to wanna give up on God. And let's be honest, people have, but we see here that Hannah does not give up. Verse nine, look what happens. Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli is the priest. He was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and don't forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now that's an interesting deal that she made with God. If you'll just give me a son, I won't cut his hair. Kind of reminds me of Samson, right? I don't know if that was like the 11th commandment, thou shalt not go to the barber shop. I don't know, it's kind of weird. Can you imagine if I couldn't cut my hair back then, I would have this beautiful skullet coming down. <laughs> You know what I'm, and just long flowing mane in the back. It would have been beautiful. Courtney, you would have loved it. But when she did this, what she's actually doing, when she says she wouldn't cut his hair, it's because she's dedicating him to a Nazarite vow. 
the very same Nazarite vow that Samson made, which was an ultimate dedication to God. You can read about that in Numbers chapter six. We don't have time to go there today, but it was a sign of her commitment to the Lord. Taking a Nazarite vow was separating someone and it was actually devoting them to God and following a specific set of restrictions. Now look what happens in verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you gonna stay drunk? Put, your wine, put away your wine. No, said my Lord. Not so, said my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Now I'm speaking to moms, but I'm gonna speak to everybody today when I tell you this, don't just settle. Hannah was in a pretty bad situation and I can imagine how hard this must have been to be reminded every time she went to the Lord of what she did not have, but she continued to go to the Lord. Desperate. And can I just say there is nothing like a praying mom. Has anybody grown up with a praying mama? Anybody else in here? I've got one. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a praying mama. Thank God for praying mamas. Hannah knew the power of prayer and she had faith to believe God could change her circumstance. She was broken. She was desperate. She's barren in a moment when being barren was dark shame. She's desperate physically and spiritually, but she was not going to settle. So I wanna talk about three quick things that you can find on the back of the bulletin. Three things we can learn from Hannah. Number one, know where to turn in times of trouble. Know where to turn in times of trouble. Hannah went to the source. She could have called up her friends and had a little lunch and said, poor me, and let's talk about my affliction. No, she didn't call her mom and say, I need some advice. No, her relationship with God was so personal and real, she cried out to God. Even so, she's drunk just because she's praying silently. You see, her silent prayer is a powerful example of heartfelt communication with God. It demonstrates her faith, her trust, and her emotional connection to God. This was not one of those one minute, Lord help me kind of prayers. No, verse 12 says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, she was not gonna settle. There's other examples in the Bible of people who kept on praying. Abraham and Sarah prayed for a son for decades. They didn't get a son until he was 100 years old. Joseph believed the dream that God gave him and that he would be ruler. He shared it with his brothers. And as you know the story, they sold him into slavery. It looked like his life was in ruins, but Joseph became the ruler years after the dream. David was king years after he killed Goliath. Peter was a rock years after Jesus told him that he would be the rock that the church was built upon. I'm not just talking about kids today. I'm not here to say that if you just keep believing, then God's gonna give you a child. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever is on your heart, what God places in your heart. Like I said, it could be a dream. It could be a child that's gone away from the Lord and you're praying they come back and man, they just keep seeming to get, get further and further away. Can I tell you, don't settle, don't give up, keep praying. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible. In other words, if you can do everything within your power and you don't need the power of God, then you're not living with faith. You're living without it. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So the challenge is, is that we kind of glorify faith because we wanna say that if you've got great faith, you're always going to have the faith face on. I'm believing God's gonna do it, amen. It's always gonna happen. There's never any doubt. But the truth is, the faith can be a little messy. It's not always constant. There are times when we have great faith and there are times when we have great doubt. I'm sure Hannah had her moments. I mean, she had a husband that loved her. Yet the Bible even said that God was the one that closed her womb. And there's this woman provoking her year after year as they would go to worship. 
That's why it's called faith, because it's not proven what's going to happen. Jesus never asked anyone to play it safe because playing it safe doesn't move us forward or help us grow. It finds us where we are and it leaves us in the same condition it found us in. There's no growth without faith. Without faith, we settle. And I believe God wants something more for your life today. So I wanna show you some real life examples of faith, the faith we're talking about. God did not answer these prayers in the way they would have liked, but their prayers were answered and God was there for them. So I want you to check this video out. Philip, do you mind to play that? Trevor and I got married in June of 2013. I was 35, he was 37, and we knew we wanted to be parents. So we immediately tried and started trying to have kids. And um, we tried for about two years with no success. Then we decided to go further in. We um, did some fertility procedures and none of them were successful. I always wanted to be a mom. I mean, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a wife and a mom. It just wasn't happening, and I was just devastated. There's really no other way to describe it, just a cycle of grief all of the, all the time. Through this just constant just hearing no, I still always knew God had a plan. His plan was different, and His plan was not um, for me to become a mom by having my own biological child. So, you know, he really put on our heart to um, look into adoption. That wasn't easy either. Um, we were matched with the baby that was stillborn. But I have to tell you, even when my faith was small, the people around me, you know, I look back and I think it was everyone's prayer around me, our church, our friends, our family, that when I was just too weak and depleted to pray, they did. When we saw Mabry, when I saw Mabry, there's no other time in my life where I can say that was God. And I saw her for the first time and all of that grief and all of that sadness and, you know, our, our babies that didn't make it and our baby that was stillborn, it all made sense. God wasn't saying no. He was just saying wait. And the wait was... The wait was perfect, and the wait was worth it. A lot of people know our story, Ryan and I's story. We tried for kids to have kids naturally for about two years on our own. After we got to that year mark and we realized nothing was happening, we kind of got sent to the infertility doctor. We went down that route, you know, with one in Kansas City. We tried that... Uh, four times and it didn't work so we heard of a doctor in Colorado of course um, as we heard that we're like this you know that's probably out of our realm of what we can do but we didn't want to give up we decided that that was kind of going to be our last stop to do it um, on our own Ryan and I. As we were getting ready to head out to Colorado, we called Chad and asked if we could have a prayer group here at church. You know, when Chad talks about our story, he brings that up a lot. And I think that was a big part of us being very hopeful with us going to Colorado. I think that that was the biggest part for me was just saying, you know, God, if this is it, then please show me some way or another. I know you will, I know it's in your plans. And I just kept telling myself, you know, in your timing. I think everybody knows the end result of Ryan and I's story. God answered our prayers through um, our two beautiful children we have. They are living miracles. We couldn't have done it without all the prayers, all the support from everybody. And um, I just think every day I look at them and I just watch them. And they, they are our miracles. It's because of God. Without him, it wouldn't have been possible. It's pretty easy what our what our endpoint is and how he answered our prayers through our children. When Kyle and I were engaged, I 
had a medical issue and we found out that we may have trouble starting a family. We did eventually get pregnant with Jace, our oldest, um, and had some more medical issues with that, so they did not recommend that we have any more pregnancies. Kyle and I briefly discussed adoption at that point, and right away we were both on board. We were on the same page. I feel like that was a God thing. It wasn't even like a big conversation. I felt really sad because of the unknown. I thought siblings would have a lot of things in common. That was one thing I thought I was going to grieve. I felt sad that um, we weren't going to have kids that <laughs> look like us. There was just like really insignificant things that um, I thought we were missing out on by not growing our family the quote unquote normal way. We definitely turned to God in prayer and um, through our community. We had a really close-knit small group at the time we were in Kansas City. We found a, an adoption consultant and she had us live with like 25 agencies. We matched with a mom in Arizona um, and that failed after a couple months. I felt really confused. We had lost a lot of our savings by matching and then losing that match. And then a week later, we found out that there was a local family looking for um, an adoptive home for their baby. It was through my parents' prayer group actually that we found them and everything clicked pretty quick after that. The most amazing part was that God didn't use like a typical path to get to where we thought we were going. I have to write down our story and kind of reread it sometimes because you can't put God in a box is what I feel like kept coming back up with this. We thought it should look a certain way. We felt like there weren't a lot of options and God just made it work anyhow. If you are someone that feels like you're constantly um, hearing no from God, God has a plan and it's a big plan. It's a better plan than anything you can even imagine or fathom. It's worth the wait. Keep your faith in God. He does answer prayers. He's not, he's not giving up on you and you can't give up on him either. If your situation feels impossible today, God does and can take the impossible and make it possible. Thank you to those three ladies for sharing that. Here's the deal, prayer works. Mark Batterson made a comment. He said, the greatest tragedy in life are prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. Some of us, we find prayer boring and maybe it's because we're praying boring prayers. And we may not believe that God will even do what he says he'll do, but that is where faith comes in. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Think about that. It's not sure of the things we know that are gonna happen. It's being sure of what we hope for. That's faith. A well-developed faith results in well-developed prayers, which results in a well-lived life. I wanna encourage some moms today to be a mother of great faith. Don't just settle. If we just look around the room, I believe there's lots of people in this room that would not be here if it wasn't for someone of great faith. Sometimes we stop praying because we think God didn't answer our prayer right away. We feel like we failed, so we just give up too soon. That isn't failure. No, the only way you can fail is if you stop praying. That's when you've given up. Not every battle is won in you know, one moment of prayer. Not every prayer is answered because you prayed for 15 minutes one time. Which leads me to the second point today, and I wanna make this very clear. This is pretty important. If you wanna write it down to help remember it, please do. In times of trouble, allow God to do something in you, not just for you. When you're going through something, let God do something in you, not just for you. If we look at Hannah's life, look at verse 10, what it said, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord. Verse 15, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. 
I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. This woman is in deep anguish. She's deeply troubled. But look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18. Look what happens next. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And it says she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Another scripture says, another version says she was no longer sad. So her outlook changed before her circumstance changed. God had not given her a child. She had been in the presence of God, crying out to him. And the Bible says she walked away no longer downcast, no longer sad. Because something in her changed before God changed her circumstance. And maybe God will do something in you before he's going to do something for you. Hannah was so completely different. It says the next morning they woke up worshiping God. Look at verse 19. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. God answered Hannah's prayer. But Hannah never forgot the vow either. She came to God and gave her son back to God just as she had promised. She was willing to accept the responsibilities that came with motherhood, to say, God, you gave me this child. I'm gonna give this child back. You know, Luke 12, 48, it says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So to the moms out there, and those who are maybe gonna dedicate your children this morning, maybe you've dedicated your children before and you're living life right now. What does that mean? Does that mean we just plead the blood over them? We just pray over them and pray that hedge of protection around them and we sit back and let God do the work? No. No, you play a part in this. Don't just pray for them, lead them. Show them that family is number one. Not just with words, show them in the way you put your phone down and listen to them and have one-on-one -on -one interaction with them in the way that you love your spouse. Show them what it means to respect another person and live with that person, to make your home a place that is protected, that is safe, and that is full of the love of God. Have you settled? Is it time to regain your family back? It's the time to pick up that dream again and start believing in something God placed in your heart. Maybe you need to be encouraged this morning that hard work matters. What it means to seek God first in his righteousness and understand that everything else will be added unto you. You can pray for those children, but something is required of you as a mother. Let me give you a quick example. When God created Adam and Eve and when he created the earth, the Bible tells us that he placed them in the garden to tend and watch over it. See, just because God gives you something doesn't dissolve you of the responsibility of working it. If you wanna take that marriage from mediocre to amazing, you're gonna have to work it. If you wanna you know, break the continuous cycle of divorce in your family, you're gonna have to work it. If you want children that know what it means to seek God first, you're gonna have to show them and work it. And this might just be my favorite part of the story right here. As we conclude this, for you moms who think that you don't have influence, for you moms that think your children aren't watching, look at what happens at the end. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27. Look at this. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. Again, she's doing exactly what she promised. She made the vow to give him back. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And look at the next line. And he worshiped the Lord there. It didn't say that she worshiped the Lord there. Samuel learned from his mother how to respect God, how to honor God, and he begins with worshiping him, which brings me to the third point, lead with your life. Let your lifestyle be an example to those children. He already knew how to worship because his mother had set the example. Samuel becomes one of the greatest servants of God because he had a mama who knew how to pray. 
And she set the example in his life. The people you love, the lives you influence, they are your legacy. The kind of people you shape your children to be is what you're gonna leave on this earth. And the faith that you have can be passed down for generations. Our influence lives on even after we die. You realize that? Just look through scripture and think about the influence that lived on. Abraham is dead, but he still speaks of faith. Moses, long time ago, but he still speaks of meekness. David still speaks of worship. Joseph, of courage. Paul still speaks of determination. You can influence the people in your life. If you're not ready for a family, that's okay. But start working on that now because one day you will have a family, and when you do have that family, you want to determine what that family is going to look like and what kind of family you're going to create. want kids and it hasn't happened? I don't have an answer for that. I pray for you. I know Mother's Day must be hard, but I can tell you, don't give up on God and don't settle. Keep asking God and keep praying and keep believing because you and your spouse are laying a foundation for future children, whether it's your children or someone else's, you can be an example to them. No matter who you are in this room, You have people you influence, people you love, which means you have people you lead. I'm gonna do you this. Let's let's ask the moms. Will you, all the moms in the room, will you stand for me? I wanna conclude this service praying for our mothers today. Mothers, we love you. We wouldn't be here without you. And I wanna read this scripture that we began just as we concluded worship. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 37 So you do not throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Do you hear that? If you will just continue to believe, God is gonna reward you for your faith. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Keep pressing on, keep going, keep trusting, keep believing, don't settle. Now, for those of you who are around a mom right now, will you reach over, take them by the hand, lay a hand on them, whatever it takes, and let's pray for these moms right now. Father, we thank you for these mothers in the room and thank you for the influence that they have in their children's lives. And God, I pray that you would give them the faith to believe, even when it's hard. God, when people might be provoking them, that they would believe beyond those provoking times, God, that even when they have doubts in their own mind and in their own heart, God, that you would place people around them to encourage them, to strengthen them, and they would continue to believe for the things that you've placed in their hearts. And thank you, Lord, for all the lives that have already been affected by these moms in the room, and I pray that that would continue. God, that we would see the faith in them the faith to believe that nothing is impossible with you. Thank you for the mamas who pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.